I'm Andy Wilson. I'm the president of the OBA, at least for now. Um, welcome to the 18th annual OBA Creighton Law School Seminar on Ethics and Professionalism. We're glad to see you here today. I got to be honest, though. I didn't want to be here today. Many of you know, and those that don't know, I'm a proud Iowa State alum and fan. I should have been in Phoenix. <laughs> you Creighton fans can understand this, right? Problem is, this school in Illinois got in the way. You know who isn't here? Judge Rossiter. Yeah, he's in Phoenix. <laughs> he's a Purdue grad. I should be there. <laughs> anyway, if I can't be in Phoenix, <clears throat> Being here with all of you is a really good alternative. And that's really at the core of what the Omaha Bar Association is all about, bringing people together in our legal community. I always look forward to this seminar, and I look forward to this one today. On behalf of the OBA, I want to give a big thank you to Scott Paul and Kendra Fershea for all their work on putting this seminar together. We look forward to their presentations. We, I also look forward to hearing from Nebraska Supreme Court Justice Stephanie Stacy in our final presentation. Where are you, Judge? Is she hiding? We're classmates, by the way. She sat in the front of the bus. I was more in the middle, maybe back. But anyway, I'm glad that she's here and I look forward to hearing from her. I understand that longtime co-chair of this event, Steve Sieberson, will be back in town next week for a book signing event for his latest book. And then he might even be here today. Steve, are you here? Are you hiding? I don't see him here. Uh, in any event, this seminar is a tremendous value for the OBA members. Two hours of ethics CLE that are free for the OBA members. If you aren't a member and you pay the $75 fee, but want to join the OBA, contact me or Dave afterwards and we can put that $75 towards your annual membership. A new feature for the OBA members, which many of you are, many of you are aware of, is that all of the OBA CLE events are included in your membership. Um, it's a great value for being a member. Um, we took Scott Paul's idea for this event from 18 years ago, uh, and we kind of ran with it, you can say. This was the start of it. For those of you interested in other OBA CLE events, there's a list of those events in your folder. I want to thank you to Creighton University School of Law for partnering with the OBA putting on this seminar. It's been a great partnership the OBA and the law school have had for over five decades. Kind of hard to believe. Uh, we're very grateful to the Creighton University Law School for this. I also want to thank Dave Summers and the OBA staff, Donna, Jean, and Sherry. They are just outstanding people and put so much effort and time into the OBA making it the great organization that it is. Let's give those guys a round of applause. <laughs> Lastly, I want to thank the law school students from Creighton that were here to help us out. Let's give those guys a round of applause too. <laughs> Just a little bit more on May 16th through the 18th, three sections of the American Bar Association will be in Omaha holding their mid-year conferences. Those sections are the Young Lawyers section, the Law Practice Management section, and the General Practice Solo section. There will be hundreds of attorneys in Omaha for this conference. This is a great opportunity for our legal community to show them our first class hospitality and to get to know them and get to know what they do in their law practices. 
The Omaha Bar is leading an effort to roll out the red carpet, if you will. And we are looking for welcoming committee and or ambassador volunteers to, to give up an evening, May 16th, 17th, or the 18th, to guide our visitors out to dine, out to have a drink, anything. And also, if anyone's interested in hoping a, hosting a small gathering at their house or at, at some other place. We're really leaning into this event as it's an opportunity for us to bond with those attorneys that are visiting Omaha that weekend. If you're interested in volunteering, helping out, doing whatever you can, reach out to Dave or me after this seminar. At this time, enough of me. I'd like to turn it over now to Scott Paul and uh, Josh Michel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, it, it's a great opportunity uh, for me to come and say hello to you. We have a big day at the law school. Uh, we have an admitted student day going on right now. So when I leave, it's nothing personal. Uh, we just have 105 guests that I need to uh, pay attention to because we're trying to make sure we have a, another great class uh, of new lawyers coming in uh, and we're excited about them. Uh, I want to say thanks to Andy, thanks to Scott Paul uh, and to Kendra and to Dave Summers for their work on this. This is a great partnership and we're excited to be uh, able to do this again. Um, Quickly, Steve Sieberson, uh, who was a part of this for a long time, is having a book, uh, book launch, a book signing uh, on April 9th at the law school at 4.30. You're welcome to join us for that. April 10th, we are uh, honoring uh, Kate Mahern, who ran our clinics uh, for almost 30 years, uh, and we are renaming at the request of uh, the donors who named the Carney Chair in Clinical Education uh, to name it after Kate Mahern. So we're excited to recognize her. Uh, if you can, if you're interested in joining us for that, that is also uh, starting at 4:30 on April 10th. April 19th, here in this room, the Law Review is hosting a sports law symposium. Uh, the keynote speaker will be uh, Val Ackerman, who is uh, an attorney and the Big East uh, Commissioner. So we're excited to have her and other experts uh, who will be joining us, and that will be 1 to 5 uh, p.m. on uh, the 19th. Um, Beyond that, I get the opportunity to introduce the first speaker. Uh, I have notes. It is not for the introduction because it is one of my favorite people on earth, my wife, uh, Kendra uh, Heward Fourche, who is, uh, probably has the toughest job in the law school. Uh, she's currently teaching family law and criminal law. She is also serving as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs uh, because Craig Allen had done more than his tour of service that he committed to, uh, and she agreed to do that. And our registrar left us. Uh, to pursue uh, more interesting things for her. And so Kendra's serving in that role too. Um, so we're putting a lot of money into what she calls the New Zealand Fund. Um, and so uh, I'm excited to have her here. Uh, she's gonna talk to you about AI and the legal profession. Uh, she has been a faculty member, uh, well, we've been in the same places. She's taught at Penn State, she's taught at University of North Dakota, at West Virginia University. Uh, this is her second time as an Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. Uh, she was the 2018 nominee, uh, Democratic nominee for Congress in the state of West Virginia, uh, which is a longer story, but that's kind of how we ended up here. So with that, like I said, my favorite person, uh, Professor and Dean Kendra, uh, Kendra Fourche. Thank you, Josh. I feel like I need to clarify a little bit because this is an ethics seminar that that New Zealand fund is actually a personal family fund that we are put, that Josh has to contribute to every time I do something extra at work. Uh, I've always wanted to go to New Zealand, very interested in the wine country there. So hopefully that will happen uh, sometime in the near future. So thank you for, um, for being here and for the service that you do as attorneys in the state of Nebraska. I'm going to talk today about, I think, something of um, real interest to most of us, I would hope, which is uh, there's been a lot of conversation and a lot of maybe hand wringing, wringing um, about artificial intelligence and how it might impact the legal profession. I wanted to take a very specific look at how it might impact ethics in the legal profession. Um, obviously, there are lots of tentacles of how artificial intelligence can affect uh, the practice of law, and you could spend I don't, countless hours exploring those questions. But today, I kind of wanted to narrow in a bit on that ethics question, obviously, germane to our purpose here. Um, 
So, but first we need to start with a little bit of background on what we mean by artificial intelligence. So, I start with the general definition of the words artificial and intelligence according to Webster's Dictionary. Um, you know, it gives us a sense of this broad topic that we are focused on. Artificial is defined as humanly contrived, often on a natural model. So, if humans contribute to creating something new that doesn't exist in nature, then that would be considered artificial. Intelligence is the ability to learn or understand or to deal with new or trying situations, the act of understanding and the ability to perform computer functions, interestingly enough. Uh, there are more definitions there, but those were the most pertinent. So the idea of artificial intelligence has actually been around for a long time, and we've been relying on it, every one of us, in one way or another for decades. Um, because the concept of artificial intelligence is um, not necessarily as fancy as what we have sort of more recently been concerned about. Um, we have used artificial intelligence. Let me uh, figure out what I'm doing here to advance. Here we go. There we go. Um, OK, so what is AI general? Oh, sorry, I think uh, I might have thrown off the system there. I'm going to back away from the <laughs> clicker. <laughs> so artificial intelligence at work, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have nothing to worry about. Um, <laughs> this is actually really an example, uh, however. Um, so the concept of artificial intelligence exists in ways that we don't really maybe credit as necessarily intelligence because it is informed more sort of directly by humans. So we've been using artificial intelligence for many years to figure out what kind of music we like if you use Spotify. Spotify listens to or pays attention to the music that you listen to and then it offers new suggestions of things that you might like, right, based on what you have listened to in the past. That is based on an algorithm or a program that a person has created to track certain musical taste, um, certain notes and the way that they're put together, and then make suggestions of what you might like. That is a version of artificial intelligence. Um, maps, directions, GPS, you know, you know, we use artificial intelligence to let, help us figure out where to go, literally. Um, we use artificial intelligence to keep us safe if you have a little you know, doorbell, ring doorbell that um, turns on when somebody approaches the, the door, that is artificial intelligence. It is an algorithm that is programmed to gather data and information that we, we may want or need. We also use artificial intelligence in the legal profession. Obviously, we use it in terms of uh, document review and we use it for legal research. If you've ever used an online legal research database, you've been using some form of artificial intelligence, and it's getting more sophisticated as time goes on. So I don't know if I should try to advance or if I should just, am I good to go? Okay, all right, hey, yeah, worked. Um, okay, what's all the fuss about that we've been hearing about more recently? Artificial intelligence is getting more intelligent and more sophisticated, and um, in late 2022, there was a new program that was released that really took a lot of people by surprise. This is the concept of generative AI or generative artificial intelligence, which actually generates information on a more sophisticated program. So while it's still programmed by humans, artificial generative AI has been programmed to go out into essentially the internet or other databases and search for information that is pertinent to the topic that you put in. Um, what was surprising and what has, I think, been concerning for a lot of people about generative AI is that it is it came along a lot faster than a lot of people predicted. So we knew, we've known it's coming for quite a while. But um, for example, I was with my son at a admitted student day at his uh, college. He goes to the University of Oregon last summer, actually it was last spring, about a year ago. 
And his computer science, one of the computer science professors in the department that he has now joined, um, was talking about how shocking computer scientists found chat GPT to be in terms of the timing. He said, if you'd asked me a year ago, if I thought it was possible that chat GPT would exist now, I would have told you no way. So, and, and he wasn't, he said, as far as he understood, he was far from alone. People who really understood the technology were very sh surprised that it one was rolled out when it was and that it actually can do a lot of the things that people uh, thought it might be capable of doing. But what generative AI does that's a little different <clears throat> is it can sort of replicate some human contributions by creating narratives based on what the machine can find on the internet. So it sort of crafts or mimics human communication by find, you know, mining all of the information that's out there on the internet and creating a, a you know, sort of a written response to a prompt that gives you information about whatever it is that you are searching. So I figured what we should do today is have a little demonstration. So what I'd like, if you've ever been to a comedy improv show, you usually have to, you know, you have to shout out a topic and a location and a name. Uh, so today what we're going to do, I would like a celebrity name. Don't be shy. You're all lawyers. Just shout out whoever pops into your head first, a celebrity name. Britney Spears. Britney Spears. Very good. Um, and a legal topic. Breach of contract. Breach of contract. Okay. And let's make the jurisdiction Nebraska. Okay, so if we put in, yep, Britney Spears, breach of contract, Nebraska. We'll just see, this is ChatGPT, what it comes up with. So this is just searching to see if there's any particular information about Britney Spears uh, breaching a contract in Nebraska. Doesn't find anything, but see how quickly that came up. Uh, it, it is disclaiming that this information might, might be outdated um, and that there might be some more specific information. And it actually suggests that you speak to a legal professional, um, which is nice. We like that. I'll tell you why in a minute, um, why it, it's, it's doing that. Um, but here's, okay, let's try another one um, that I came up with. Because And because I'm a law professor, I was going to go with the favorite topic that everybody had while they were in law school, the rule against perpetuities. Um, so how about LeBron James, rule against perpetuities, and we'll do Nebraska again, and go ahead. Okay, so similar response, but let's change it a little bit this time. And let's do a little bit more sophisticated search that perhaps a lawyer would use to find out information about whether LeBron James would be a good life and being for the use of the rule against perpetuities. So if we put in LeBron James as life and being, <coughs> rule against perpetuities, and then Nebraska, and see what happens. So now you get a little bit of legal doctrine, and it explains the concept a little more deeply than the, the more general searches. So this is a search that perhaps someone who's just looking for a place to start, because I know you can't believe it, but maybe somebody doesn't remember how the rule against perpetuities works after they graduate from law school, take the bar exam, so they might need a jumping off point. If a person who's not a lawyer wants to use ChatGPT to find out something that's sophisticated like this, though, they wouldn't necessarily know what language to put in. So if we put in, instead of the more specific or uh, particular language, if an individual wanted to figure out, maybe they think, well, I just want to give my property to my kids and I want it to stay in the family. An individual might search something like, I think I wrote something down, um, how do I give my property to my kids? So let's put that in.
Oh, <laughs> uh oh, um, AI is on to us. This may be actually because I didn't log in. Uh, there we go. Okay, this is what I got earlier. So you get a bunch of different sort of explanations of the, the ways that you could perhaps, uh, you know, create a, um, a transfer to, to the family, but it wouldn't necessarily flag something like the rule against perpetuities. And, um, and so it create you know, it says you should check with a legal professional. There may be more that you need to know. But if you use this and kind of refine and refine, you can start getting into much more specific information and start building perhaps a little bit more of uh, a lawyer, lawyerly sounding um, whatever it is that you want to build, right? A, a will or a trust. You could try to build it yourself, but you would probably be missing a lot of things unless you had the more specific search terms. Okay, so then switching back to the PowerPoint. Aha, very good. Thank you. So, and then on to the next, let's see here. There we go. Um, so pros and cons with AI, it's not all bad, right? Um, there are lots of potential upsides to it. So the pros are that it's efficient and cost saving. You can actually do a lot of things a lot faster than you used to be able to, particularly with legal research, for example, or document review. You can search particular terms. And you know, if you know that there's a, a problem with a one term, uh, which is often the case, right? Or you have a, you know, a specific request, then you can put those terms in to AI and very, very quickly find what you are looking for. Um, it can provide a, a starting point for sometimes tedious work. You know, you, you, have, you used, to, used to have to slog through every page, whereas this might um, speed things along and, and make it a little more interesting. And it can, the, uh, an upside is that it is human-like in that it can mimic communication uh, that, uh, and style that humans use so that you can get some, um, something that you can understand, right? That if you want to put in some search terms and come up with a starting point, um, then you can, you can likely do that very quickly. The downsides, and there are some significant ones, particularly for the legal profession, for sure. This is an interesting thing that I found when I started doing research into AI. AI is not designed for accuracy. It's not designed to be precise. It is designed to be reductive. It's designed to go out into the internet and piece together stuff that already exists, not to predict what should happen or what may happen in the future. And when it starts to kind of go rogue and starts predicting things, that's where we get into perhaps some trouble. Reliance on it, for, from a perspective of a legal education standpoint, reliance on AI can help students avoid learning new topics. That's a huge problem, right, for, uh, for law schools and the legal profession. Um, downside, major downside, is that it's not human, right? It doesn't understand humor or charm or empathy. It doesn't have the, uh, an ability to uh, sort of find nuance and apply, um, you know, very specific details, those need to be supplied by humans. Okay, so there are obvious impacts on really every aspect of the legal profession. Um, it has impacts on both litigation and transactional work. Um, criminal law, there are some very concerning um, impacts on criminal law, for example, AI can analyze evidence and can uh, make you know, some uh, useful analysis of fingerprints or surveillance footage. It can analyze the chances of reoffending in the context of criminal, law, uh, criminal sent sentencing for defendants. Um, but the problem is fairness and transparency are not uh, AI's long suit, which is obviously uh, a very serious problem when we're applying the concepts of these artificial intelligence programs to human lives, the, even a one mistake could be hugely problematic. Policing and corrections. There's also a lot of, um, a lot of analysis in how AI can be helpful when it comes to policing. It can uh, predict 
um, where crime may happen based on past data. For in, the, in terms of policing, it can monitor communications, location, and biometrics of uh, incarcerated individuals in the context of uh, corrections. But both of those things also have significant downsides. Predictive policing often results in over-policing of marginalized communities and doesn't necessarily stop crime. And um, over-monitoring and control in the corrections context with no per particular purpose can raise anxiety levels of the individuals in that situation and can create much more um, volatile uh, circumstances. Academia, obviously we're concerned that students could um, you know, use AI to make it look like they're doing the work that they're supposed to be doing and avoid actually learning the concepts that underpin the academic uh, endeavor. However, if they use AI and we teach them to use AI in a useful way, it could be a really useful jumping off point, but you've got to learn the underlying principles first, right? Um, okay, and then of course, ethics. Okay, so generally, while this was meant for basically all of the potential uh, areas of concern or of interest with AI, the Biden administration um, issued this executive order in October of 2023. All of these topics have very serious implications for the legal profession. So while this is a general list, it obviously has a lot of impacts on what we do as lawyers. So the, the executive order focused on a few, uh, well, several important topics, one being international concerns with AI, whatever protections we put into place in the United States are essentially moot if we don't have agreements with other parts of the world because AI can be anywhere, right? Um, so it can infiltrate our space from somewhere else. So we need to have good international relationships to address issues there. Equity and inclusion. So a big concern for everyone who's involved with or should be a big concern for everyone who's involved with AI is the concept of equity and inclusion because the algorithms that are used for AI are either intentionally or unintentionally influenced by racism and sexism, particularly on the internet. So a couple of examples. First, the internet is rife, as we know, with very unpleasant uh, information sometimes. And that information can be very uh, derogatory uh, and obviously directed at people of color and women. Um, but also the internet is seeded with information that is institutionally or historically accurate, but it also results in racist or sexist application. So like, here are some examples. When Amazon uh, started a program a few years ago to help hire people uh, or look for potential um, new talent. They started a program that went through resumes and looked for people who had um, potentially very useful um, backgrounds for tech degrees. Um, because women are historically underrepresented in the tech industry, the AI program that was doing the searching started learning, right? Started gleaning from all of the information that it gathered that women were to be uh, lowered in the priority um, of, for hiring because they, the assumption was that because they aren't represented in tech and they didn't have resume uh, items that showed that they had a lot of uh, tech background historically that women were less qualified and the, the program started to write in that men were preferred explicitly. So the AI program that was meant to help build a bigger pool actually was reducing women's uh, resumes to the bottom of the pile and pushing men's up because it perceived them as simply more qualified on the basis of their maleness, not their actual individual qualifications. So it was looking for men in particular. Another example, there's the, uh, this is in the context of corrections, the Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions Program 
used to predict whether convicted felons would reoffend. Uh, the system was far more likely to identify defendants who are black as more likely to reoffend, even if the data showed that white offenders were more likely to reoffend um, with all of the same inputs. So if, if controlling for um, the same and for all other factors, the technology was making inaccurate predictions about the possibility or the likelihood, better said, of reoffending. So it showed that white defendants were low risk when 48% of those defendants went on to reoffend. And it showed black defendants as 28%, uh, sorry, more likely to be a risk, and they were actually 28% um, in that pool became reoffenders. So it was very inaccurate predicting what it was designed to predict, and not simply on the basis of race. And then the last example in healthcare, AI algorithms underestimated black patients' needs by giving them lower risk scores than white, counterpart, white counterparts when all other factors were controlled and did not qualify black patients as eligible for extra care when white patients did qualify. Again, all factors controlled. So AI was looking for something that we didn't predict or whoever programmed it didn't predict it would be looking for. And it started applying those factors to the detriment of the users. This is obviously a very concerning situation. So um, these last three categories, the Biden administration identified safety and security, trust, uh, assuring trustworthiness and fraud protection as needing regulation, oversight, and uh, study to make sure that AI does not, is not used to um, sort of prey on people as opposed to help people avoid being preyed upon. Okay, so now moving on more specifically to the legal profession. The issues that we see that we're already starting to see with respect to AI kind of more broadly in the legal profession is uh, particular to us in the law school. We are concerned, obviously, about students using AI to plagiarize work or to substitute learning. Um, we're also concerned about, you know, just more broadly in the legal profession, people being able to rely upon AI for the purposes of creating their own pro se documents. Um, and they may actually rely on it wrongly and really hurt themselves in the process, or they may rely on it in a way that is convincing enough that it seems legitimate. And the you know, litigants, pro se litigants could win a case that they shouldn't and perhaps create, create precedent that then is uh, very problematic, right? So um, if, if the parties, you know, if, if it's not caught. So you hear all these examples, it's happening over and over again, people getting into a time crunch, using AI to, to draft some sort of legal memoranda that they file with the court, only then to discover that perhaps the AI uh, program made up cases, which has happened. Um, totally cra created cases that didn't exist because AI thought, oh, this is fun. We do this thing where there's a name and then a V and another name, that's gotta mean something, right? So it just started making up you know, party versus party and submitting them as citations the person who used that program to do that didn't check, submitted, and this has happened more than once, uh, same scenario, submitted the document or the, the um, filing and um, got in a lot of trouble for it. But what if that happens and nobody catches it? That's problematic as well. And that those were lawyers. Um, we can only imagine what pro se litigants might find themselves. They wouldn't even necessarily know to check. And then the last, obviously, transactional documents, there are impacts. Um, you know, people are using AI to draft contracts. There, there's nuance that's lost, perhaps, um, that we need to be aware of. So let's talk a little bit more about that with respect to our uh, rules of professional conduct. Um, just three examples here. There are probably a lot of other ways that AI has impacts on us as, uh, as licensed attorneys. But first, focusing on confidentiality, obviously, we have an obligation to keep our clients' uh, information confidential. And that literally includes everything 
like that the fact that you represent someone at all. That is assumed to be confidential unless you need to reveal that information to um, actually represent your client, which of course oftentimes we do. So it becomes part of the understanding that that information is uh, not going to be oh, confidential in every context, but every single thing that we know about a client, including their name, is confidential. But in order for a chat GPT to work, you have to put in information to inform it, right? It needs to be taught. And so if you put in information about your client that is specific enough to get the information you need, you are breaching confidentiality rules in many respects. And that is a, a, obviously of great concern. Um, so, you know, if you strip out all that confidential information, you're going to get bad legal advice. If you put the confidential information in, this is a problem because AI feeds and reads the internet. So the AI goes to read what is out there, but it also feeds the information that it is creating back out into the internet as part of the pool of information that is useful in another later search. So it's feeding confidential information out, which is obviously problematic. Um, but <laughs> we've got the flip side. We may be finding in short order that not using generative AI is a problem of competency. If it exists and it can help us, maybe we should be using it. And so there may be a conundrum here that we're stuck sort of between a rock and a hard place in that we are trying to feed confidential information into the system, get good results while avoiding violating our duty of uh, confidentiality. And we are under an obligation to make sure that we're checking all of the sources of information that are out there to ensure that we are um, thorough. So there's a potential problem there. Um, and then scope of authority, I was thinking of this in terms of, we know that lawyers are responsible for the, the sort of uh, procedure and putting together uh, the best product for the client, but the client makes the ultimate decisions, right? Client decides whether to plead out, whether to uh, settle, um, you know, the, the, big, the big calls. And if a client really wants you to use AI, and AI gives you a bad product, you may find yourself kind of stuck in the scope of authority. Who is the boss here, right? Does the client want me to use this information that is incorrect um, or is not nuanced enough? Am I now under an obligation to actually use it? Now that is, I think, in some ways less of a concern because ultimately we as attorneys are always responsible for what we put our names on. And we have an ethical responsibility to stand by what we prepare, which is obviously also an admonition that if we use AI, we absolutely must ensure that whatever we file or whatever we produce for our client comes from us ultimately. That we are reading it carefully, we are checking everything that it suggests, we are only using it as an opportunity to check, uh, to you know, sort of make sure that what we're doing is thorough and and um, and we that we you know maybe there was a stone left unturned that AI helps us turn, uh, but we are always responsible for that which we create for our clients. <coughs> so, where do we go from here? From here, so uh, you know I threw out some ideas. Maybe we could like completely reform legal practice from top to bottom. Uh, start shutting down the law schools. We don't need them anymore. AI is going to take over or create a whole new set of ethics rules. I don't think any of those things are necessary and I don't think any of them are um, going to come to fruition, certainly not anytime soon. And this is why. I think one of the things that we can do as lawyers to be ethical and be um, thoughtful about AI is remember that which distinguishes us from AI, which is our humanity. The very fact that we are human is what makes us important to our clients and crucial, in fact, as opposed to a machine that can give information, but not the other things that we can do. We can supply empathy, sometimes humor, depends on the person. Um, 
sometimes charm, depends on the person. We can be humble. We can, we can exhibit humility and accept our mistakes. We can be transparent and accountable. And we can serve our clients in a way that a machine cannot. We can adjust and we can be um, kind and we can listen. So I think the best thing that we can do to be the, um, you know, the long lasting providers of service to our clients is to remember that they are human and we are human and that the best lawyers that we can be requires us to, you know, lean into those emp empathic um, and humble and service related values that we all hopefully share. So that's all I have. I appreciate your, your time and welcome any questions. I'm not sure where we are <clears throat> on time, but if we, anybody has questions, I'll try to answer, but I, uh, I may also have to defer to the internet because there's uh, a lot of information out there. Okay, all right, thank you. Have a good afternoon. Probably should have introduced you, Scott. Okay. Make sure my microphone works, Dave. Can you hear me okay? All right, good. First of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a sunny day, it's a nice weather out, and any time we can keep people off the golf course to come in and listen to ethics is, is a, a good thing, I suppose. So we appreciate that. Uh, usually I'm the third speaker, and usually that means you get uh, coffee, coffee or cookie or something like that, and we have a break, and then um, I speak, and then I tell you goodbye, and we'll see you next year. We will have our break after my presentation, and then the Honorable Stephanie Stacy will come in and do her presentation, and then we will have our dismissal. So today, I want to talk to you about an, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to talk to you about a number of things. Deposition misconduct is one of them. Let me see if I can call that up. Here we go. Deposition misconduct statutes you may want to use or not. Private public reprimands. We'll investigate that a little bit. In recent ethics opinions, there's a couple from Iowa. There's also, I believe, one from Nebraska that may be of some interest. Hopefully, these will be of interest to you. We'll start with ADA Formal Opinion 508. It details what lawyers can and can't do when preparing witnesses. This is a new opinion that just came down several months ago. And so it's been in, the, in some of the media from, from law schools and uh, legal organizations. It's, uh, it's instructive, but again, it's just guidance. Certain categories of lawyer activity are firmly established as unethically interfering with the integrity of the justice system and unethically obstructing another party's access to evidence. Make no mistake, you cannot counsel a witness to tell anything but the truth. And so when we're going to talk about witness preparation today, keep in mind that the witness needs to understand that they're supposed to go in and tell the truth. And it's your obligation to make sure the witness understands that. So nothing that we'll be talking about today will detract from that. Although you will find that I don't necessarily agree with some of the some of the authorities that we're going to be citing today as uh, author authorities on some of these deposition practices. But nevertheless, the bottom line is the witness should tell the truth. Now, it's easy for you to tell a witness tell the truth if they're, if they're your client. That's uh, a privileged communication. If they're a witness, you should all the more reason to tell the client to tell the truth, because that's something they can be asked about. The opposing counsel can say, have you had conversations with Mr. Paul, or have you had conversations with your lawyer? And the witness will have to say yes, and I have to disclose what those conversations are. <coughs> well, what did he tell you? Well, he told me to tell the truth. Well, that's always great to hear. And, and, and so you want to make sure the witness, if, if it's a witness and not your client, you want to make sure they parrot that back if they're asked, did you have a discussion with counsel? What did counsel tell you? What did he hear? Lawyers never want to hear. He told me to tell the truth. So keep that in mind. The problem about witness coaching and, and uh, woodshedding, 
was exacerbated during the, the, the pandemic. Uh, I think we had a lot of one camera video. We had a lot of uh, video depositions and there was more abuse of the process when we had the one camera and, and video depositions during the pandemic. The lawyers have an ethical duty to prepare clients and witnesses before hearings. These are the rules that you need to follow in order to prepare your clients or witnesses for depositions. Rule 1.1 is competence. That's probably the most important one. You'll see it. We'll discuss that a little bit further later. Rule 1.3 is diligence. 3.3, candor toward the, tri toward the tribunal. 3.4, fairness to opposing party and counsel. And 8.4, 8 as I almost call that, the sledgehammer. That's kind of the catch-all for, every, for everything. And it's the administration of justice is impacted through fraud or misconduct. ABA Formal Opinion 508 attempts to explain the difference between legitimate witness preparation or guidance and unethical efforts to influence witness testimony, sometimes called coaching. Now, I don't think coaching is all that bad in the deposition, in, before the deposition, in the process of preparing a witness. There's some coaching that has to go on here. And the authorities seem to take the word coaching and they seem to say, well, you can't coach, you, you can't, but you can provide guidance. I think that's just semantics. And what we've seen is that witnesses and parties that are getting their deposition taken, they're quite often in, in awe of the process. They're, they're quite often in, intimidated by the process. They don't know what they don't know. They don't know what they can do and what they can't do. So consequently, some of them have diarrhea of the mouth when they're testifying and you wish they would be quiet. Other times, witnesses don't say anything or say very little because they're concerned about what they're being told and what, what they're being asked. So there is some obligation here to explain this process to the witness so the witness understands what's going on and what their role is. Opinion 508 also acknowledges the distinction can, can be ambiguous and, it, and it indeed can be ambiguous, owing in large part to the concurrent ethical duties to diligently and competently re represent a client and to refrain from improperly influencing witnesses. So there's a cross rough there. There's a tension that exists between making sure the witness testifies accurately and truthfully, and yet doesn't volunteer things that aren't asked by the, the opposing party. William Hodes wrote a law review article on this subject, and he, one of the quotes from it is, journey not far enough and the lawyer deserves sanction for failing to carry out the most basic duties encompassed by the client lawyer relationship. So what he's saying is that you got, it's your affirmative duty to go in and, and, and prepare these witnesses for testimony. And if you don't do it enough, if you don't do it well enough, then it's a situation where maybe the, the finger should be pointed at you for not doing your job. Preparing clients and witnesses for depositions, court hearings, and trials is necessary, but again, it does not include encouraging them, encouraging them to fabricate testimony. For example, lawyers should not kick the witness under the table. Boy, you're laughing. It's true. I saw it happen. It happened to me in a deposition in Lincoln, and it was before the pandemic, so it wasn't involving any video depositions or anything like that. As a veteran lawyer, a sophisticated client, I was taking their deposition and I, I began to notice that every time I asked a question, I thought it was a very good question for me. And uh, the, the witness gave kind of a honky response. I thought, that doesn't really fit the question. And I began to notice there was some movement on the witness's lawyer on his chair at the same time the witness was answering or right before the witness answered. So I thought, and that's odd. And so I leaned back in my chair, put my notebook on my lap, and my, my list of questions on my lap, where I could see the, the, the feet of the opposing counsel underneath the table. And sure enough, I'll be damned if he didn't kick him the next time I asked ask the witness a question. And of course, he denied doing it. He had a spasm in his leg or something like that. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, but the bottom line was, he didn't do it again after that. But it happens. This stuff happens where witnesses will kick, or client, lawyers will kick witnesses under the table, where they will wink at them. Winking occurs when you got one video camera, uh, you got maybe the court reporter's not there, or the court reporter is there, but not paying attention, and lawyers will wink at their client. Obviously, you can't do that either. Under opinion 508, it's unethical to tell the witness to downplay the number of times a witness and a lawyer met to prepare for trial testimony. 
I'll push back a little bit on this one because I think the question that needs to be asked is, how many times did you, you and your lawyer meet to prepare for your, your testimony? I think that's privilege. It's not privilege, it's work product. And in any event, I think I would have, I would feel comfortable going to the court and defending that one. And if the court says you, the witness has to answer, then I would let the witness answer, obviously. But I think there, there's a work product issue there in trying to determine how many times the witness is engaged in witness preparation meetings with the lawyer. Certainly, the, the witness can be asked, did you and your lawyer or did you and, did you and the lawyer uh, prepare for the testimony, uh, get together and talk? Yes. How many times? Well, that's where I think I would insert the work product objection. Again, surreptitious off-camera activities such as texting the witness are, are prohibited. It's your fault if you let the witness go into a deposition with the cell phone. If somebody can text the witness while they're giving a deposition, that's your fault for missing that because you don't want to have a witness have access to a cell phone during their deposition. It's just not anything that anybody wants to get involved in, but it happens. And it apparently has happened in, in, in occasions to uh, require this ABA formal opinion to re reference it. So if rule number one is make sure your witness or make sure the witness doesn't have a cell phone at, accessible to them during their depositions. Opinion 508, let's see where I'm at here. Okay. Opinion 508 lists a host of activities lawyers ethically can do pursuant to Rule 1.1, and there's competence. And they, there again, that's the most important rule as it requires uh, for witness preparation. Providing witness with effective preparatory guidance is undoubtedly a component of the thoroughness and preparation element of Rule 1.1. Effective preparatory guidance, that's a euphemism. What does that mean? It means coaching. It means guidance. But when you call it effective preparatory guidance, it doesn't sound quite as bad as coaching, I guess. This is what you can do with a witness for purposes of preparation. You can remind the witnesses they will be under oath. That doesn't do any good. You can emphasize the importance of telling the truth. Yeah, you gotta tell them that, that you should tell them that, but it doesn't help them with their testimony any. You can explain that telling the truth can include a truthful answer if I do not recall, or I don't recall. We'll get into that a little bit later. That might help. You can explain the case strategy and procedure, including the nature of testimonial process or the purpose of the deposition. That's not gonna help them with their testimony. They may understand the process a little bit better, but they're not gonna understand what they should say or how they should say it. Finally, you can suggest proper attire and appropriate demeanor and decorum. How they're dressed or how they treat the opposing counsel, again, it's not going to go very far in terms of getting their testimony to be fair and accurate. There's, all, there's a few others, though, that do provide some assistance. Provide context for the witness testimony. That's something you can do. So you can say, <clears throat> if the witness is an eyewitness, you can talk to them about their eyesight, you can talk to them about the lighting, you can talk to them about things that would affect the veracity of their opinion. You can say, he's going to ask you this or she's going to ask you that. You can give them some idea of what the questions have been in other depositions that, that have been taken in the case. You can inquire, in, in, you can inquire into the witness probable testimony and recollection. You can ask them, do you recall? If you recall this, then what? If you recall that, then what? That, that's appropriate fair game. You can identify other testimony that's expected to be presented and explore the witness's version of events in light of that testimony. For example, well, everybody else has said this. Now, is it your testimony that that occurred or is your testimony the same as theirs? So you can compare their testimony to other witnesses who have testified or other positions that have been taken in the case. Opinion 508 also goes on to talk about behaviors lawyers may not engage in according to the opinion. Again, uneth unethical coaching, testimony coaching. No, I put the before and after in there to highlight the fact that once you're in the deposition, and we're going to talk about that in, the, in a minute, it's much more difficult to do your coaching through speaking objections, and you can't give the witness over instructions as to how to answer questions. But before the deposition starts, in the, in the form of preparation, you can say a lot more that it could be included or interpreted as being fair game before the deposition than you can during the deposition. And then absolutes, I, I just wanted to make sure I, I referenced that when I put that in the, the outline. 
I always tell my witnesses when I, they're about to give their deposition or they're about to go in to, to testify that they should never use, never use uh, absolutes such as never and ever because that locks them in. And they should listen to those for those questions or those words and the questions that they're asked. Did you ever do this? Well, it, that means ever at any time. Do you, is it your testimony you never do this? Well, I, you're saying I never do that at all? Those are, are words that the witness needs to be on the lookout for. It says over, overt, overly attempting. It should be co covertly attempting to manipulate testimony and progress within most situations constitute at least conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice in violation of the Rule 8.4. That's the sledgehammer rule that is, is used quite often to discipline lawyers. Also mentioned in the article is a more subtle type of speaking, so speaking objection called covert coaching. It goes beyond stating the objection and providing the basis for the objection and suggests how the witness should answer the question during the testimony. And one of the things I've heard many times in depositions is, well, I don't object to form. I don't, answer, I don't understand the question. If you understand the question, you can answer. The witness generally will not answer the question and saying, I don't understand it either. Well, we've seen courts have been critical of that type of speaking objection. And we'll see an example of that critical nature of that, of, uh, that, that obje objection coming up here just in a few minutes. One of the things you can always do if you're the witness or if you're the attorney, is you can ask that the question be repeated or rephrased. If the lawyer is under no obligation, the opposing counsel is under no obligation to rephrase the question. He's entitled to phrase the question the way he wants, but he should repeat the, 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 the question. Now, if you're asked to re repeat a question, if I'm the lawyer that's, that's asked it, I would look at the court reporter and make sure the court reporter reads the question back. It gives the lawyer time to think about his next question. The lawyer, the, and the, the, the witness has probably asked for that reading, reading back or asked for that repeating of the question so that they can have more time to think. As counsel, if you don't understand the, the question, if you, you want to hear it again, you're entitled to ask for the question to be repeated as well. Again, you should have the court reporter read it back to you. But if you do that more than a few times, it's going to be very obvious what's going on. And it, you're not really asking the question to, that the question be repeated, or uh, you're asking the, for reasons to uh, instruct the witness what's going on. So if you do it more, more than a couple times during a deposition, there's going to be some questions to ask, I'm sure. I mentioned I don't recall. Let's see where I'm at here. Here we go. I mentioned I don't recall. The gray area is still in how much or little to prompt recollection during witness, during preparation rather than during live testimony. So if a witness is inclined to testify, I don't recall, they need to be able to live with that and need to be prepared to live with that. Because what you don't want is a situation where a witness says, I don't recall. And then after the deposition, after they're on record with their testimony, then they go and educate themselves about the case or about what their position is. If that's, a, if that's a situation you're, you're, you're faced with, it could damage the witness's credibility on the, on the witness stand. First of all, in the 30B6 deposition, if you're deposing a corporate representative, you've got a duty to educate the, the witness as to the categories that they're being offered for testimony on. The, the worst thing you can do with a 30B6 deposition witness is have that witness testify, if it's your witness, have them testify that they don't know. I don't know is a bad answer for a 30B6 witness deposition um, because then the corporation doesn't know and nobody knows at the corporation. So there again, it's, it's your obligation to educate witnesses that are offered for 30B6. And I don't recall needs to be used in those situations very sparingly. Is ignorance bliss? That's what I mentioned about if you say you don't recall, then you may be stuck with that reference for quite for the rest of the case, basically. It may be binding. The lawyer on the other side may ask, well, you prepared for a deposition, didn't you? Or you reviewed documents for your deposition and we went over what those documents were, or you discussed your recollection with counsel. That's one that may draw a privilege objection, but you get the point. The witnesses can be chided for claiming they don't recall by virtue of other things that they've done or said in the case. 
here we go. This is the Hall case. Very famous case from the District of Pennsylvania. It comes out of the federal court district at that time, at that location. Hall has not been overruled and remains the law of the case for cases filed in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. What does Hall say? Hall addresses conferences with the witness in debates during depositions or trial. There's no express ethical prohibition on communications between the witness and counsel during a break in the testimony. But judges have, at times, exercised control over these circumstances, including entering specific orders and imposing deposition guidelines and or sanctions. It's a little bit odd to think that we have all these rules for depositions and we have all these rules for, for ethics, but we don't have any rule that says you can't talk to your client during a deposition or you can't talk to your client during your, their trial testimony. But that is, that is the ruling, at least to this Hall case. Now, it, as we'll see, it has not been adopted by many, many uh, jurisdictions, but nevertheless, in this jurisdiction, in Pennsylvania, it is the, the, still the rule. You know, we also note that judges have, at times, exercised control over these circumstances. It means that judges haven't always done it. They, they pick their spots. And so it depends on the case and it depends on the facts as to whether or not they're going to enforce some of the Hall prohibitions. Hall stands for the proposition that a lawyer and a client do not have an absolute right to confer during a client's testimony. Although the lawyer has a right, if not the duty, to prepare a client for a deposition, he or she does not have the right to confer with the client once the deposition begins. And you can understand why that's the case, because the lawyer could be trying to rehabilitate the client from a bad answer or educate the client as to how they should answer another question in the case. And there's reasons why the, the lawyer should not be able to do that during the testimony. Before the testimony, during the preparation, it's probably more appropriate. Paul goes on to say, during a civil trial, witnesses and his or her lawyer are not permitted to confer at their pleasure during the witness's testimony. Once a witness has been prepared and has taken the stand, that witness is on his or her own, as is true at a deposition. Now, many of you, like, like me, have tried cases in the Douglas County Hall of Justice. We get a break during the testimony. Let's say your client's on the stand, or the, the, the plaintiff's on the stand, or the defendant's on the stand, whoever. You go out in the rotunda, rotunda of the Hall of Justice, and what do you see? You see the client and, and their, their, their attorney sitting on one of the pews or standing at the, at the uh, rotunda area and in, in deep conversation. And they're talking about the case. They're talking about the testimony. It's obvious what's going on. But under Hall, that's not permitted. And it just happens every day. It, it's, it's, it's something that... There's a reason why I think you're going to see many, many different jurisdictions don't adopt the Hall case, but it's one of those cases where that it happens all the time. For example, in the rotunda of the Hall of Justice, you can you can see where lawyers are at telling their client, "Well, he's going to ask you this, or you said in your deposition that." These are all things that could come up and do come up during the, the converse, conversations and conferences around the rotunda of the Hall of Justice. The test I, I, I would use is, what do you want the judge to hear? If the judge was standing right there, would you be comfortable saying what you're saying to your client if the judge was standing right there? Use that as your guide to keep in mind how you would do that because it's not beyond the realm of possibility that you could go back into the, into the courtroom if your client's on the window stand, have the next question be, what did you and your client talk about out around the, hall, the rotunda or while you were sitting in the pews in the, in the waiting area? The fact that there's no judge in the room to prevent private conferences does not mean that such conferences should or may occur. According to the Hall opinion, these rules also apply during recesses at a deposition. So it's not just trial testimony, it's also deposition testimony. Once the deposition has begun, the preparation period is over and the deposing lawyer is entitled to pursue the chosen line of inquiry without interjection by the witness's counsel. Private conferences are barred during the deposition and fortuitous the fortuitous occurrence of a coffee break, lunch break, or evening recess is no reason to change the rules. I can count on, on one hand a number of times where this has happened, but one of the things we see in depositions is lawyers will say, 
when after a break, the, the lawyer and, and their client will come back in and sit down at the conference table and be ready to resume. The first question, did you or did you talk to your lawyer about anything substantive in the case? And sometimes it surprises the witness, sometimes it surprises the opposing counsel. It shouldn't, it's, it's a normal question to, to ask. But one of the questions that it gets asked in this situation, you basically need to say, you get to use it once because they're re- going to be ready for it after that. But you might catch them by surprise. You should always ask them about documents. Have you reviewed any documents during the break? Because it's quite often there isn't any discussion to refer to, but there may be documents that they're reviewing. You can ask them what, what documents, you can ask them why, and so on. Of course, this is the one exception to all of this, and that's the attorney client privilege. An exception is made where counsel or the witness interjects an objection based on the attorney client privilege, and that gives you a lot more leeway with your client to object to depositions or deposition questions to make sure that the question is not eliciting testimony that's covered by the attorney client privilege. So that, that's the one exception you should keep in mind and use if you need to, where it applies, obviously. Uh, in situations with deposition testimony. Okay. See here. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Okay. All right, here we go. Several states have adopted language from Hall and their respective rules of civil procedure. So some states have adopted parts of Hall. Uh, so the varying degrees, you need, to, you need to basically do your research to determine whether the authority of that jurisdiction is the same as the Hall case. Other courts refuse to implement any of the Hall guidelines. So it could be that nothing from Hall is of any use or help to you there but you need to do your research again to make sure that you're aware of how this issue is treated. Still other courts have adopted a limited form of Hall guidelines to curb deposition misconduct. And that's really what it comes down to. You're gonna see more of the Hall type enforcement, more, more of the Hall type guidelines imposed on opposing counsel for deposition misconduct or trial misconduct, where the, the conduct is egregious, where the conduct is, is the, mis, the misconduct is such that it causes the, um, a disruption of the attorney, attorney client privilege. It causes a disruption of the questions being asked of the lawyer to the client. In those situations, um, you're going to get more receptive comments from the court. You're going to be more, uh, the court's going to be more receptive to your arguments if you can point to situations where the facts and the questions and the objections are egregious. So keep that in mind. It's not, it's not a one size fit all, fits all situation. We'll come back to that one. You, you can see we've got a citation. There we go. At the bottom, Security National Bank of Sioux City, Iowa versus Abbott Laboratories. This is another outlier case that I wanted to discuss with you very briefly. Um, it, it's a case that comes from Sioux City, uh, federal court in Sioux City. Mark Bennett it was the uh, judge who wrote the opinion. Uh, in Security National, after a defense verdict in a baby formula product liability case, Judge Mark Bennett issued an order sua sponte, meaning on his own motion, directing defense counsel to show cause as to why she should not be sanctioned for obstructive conduct at depositions. Now, Judge, Judge Bennett is now a mediator, I think. I see him advertised in the Iowa Lawyer magazine. I think he's retired, uh, but he's known for, for this opinion and like many other opinions written by Judge Bennett for having long opinions going into great detail as to deposition misconduct or whatever he's reading, writing about at the time. Uh, this, this case is instructive for kind of the extreme view of what you can and can't do in terms of deposition conduct. Um, he gives many examples of questioning in this opinion. So I would commend it to you for that, if nothing else, so you can see how the extreme uh, view of these, these deposition questions and the objections or the conduct of the parties is, uh, is viewed by the judge. The court's opinion discusses form objections, witness coaching, excessive inter- interruptions to the questioning, and appropriate sanctions. 
Judge Bennett's opinion notes that litigators, and I'm going to come back to that term a number of times because the word litigators is not a, a favorite term of Judge uh, Bennett. If you're a litigator, you're not one of his favorites. If you're a trial lawyer that understands what, what, what you're doing, they do a good job. He likes trial lawyers. He doesn't really like litigators. He, he treats them or assumes that they are just doing deposition work or discovery work or document review uh, and that they're not competent to, to, try, to try cases. So, for example, Judge Bennett's opinion notes that litigators and trial lawyers, so he makes the distinction between litigators and trial lawyers, do not deserve all the blame for obstructions, discovery, and conduct because judges so often ignore this conduct, and by doing so, we reinforce, even incentivize, obstructionist tactics. You know, he's absolutely right about that. District court judges, uh, trial court judges, whether it be state court, federal court, magistrates, they hate discovery disputes like this. And so if you, you called them every time on the phone, you were at a deposition, and you were seeking a ruling on this conduct or that conduct, you, you, you would wear out your welcome very, very quickly. And the, these judges wouldn't be able to get anything done because they would be inundated with calls about this conduct or that conduct. And so he's absolutely right that part of the reason why some, some of this deposition misconduct occurs is because the courts haven't set forth a coherent, coherent policy in terms of how to deal with them. So he goes on, most litigators will often inept in jury trials. There again, he's taking a shot at litigators or only because they so seldom experience them are both smart and savvy and will continue to do what has worked for them in the past. The judge said, obstructionist litigators, like Pavlov's dogs, salivate when they see discovery requests and are conditioned to unleash their treasure chests of obstructive weaponry. There again, he's comparing, comparing litigators to Pavlov's dogs. So you can get some indi indication of where he's coming from in terms of his uh, preference for litigators or not. Unlike Pavlov's dogs, their rewards are not food but successfully, blo successfully blocking or impeding the flow of discoverable information. Unless judges impose serious adverse consequences, like court-imposed sanctions, litigators conditional, there again, litigators, conditional reflexes will, pers will persist. The point of court-imposed sanctions is to stop reinforcing winning through obstruction. I fully agree with that. We need to get the courts more involved. We need lawyers who cannot necessarily police themselves on the, some of these issues. So he's absolutely right in terms of the goal that he's trying to address here. It's just how he does it is perhaps somewhat difficult. In the section on witness coaching, Judge Bennett stated, quote, unless a question is truly so vague and ambiguous that the defending lawyer cannot possibly discern its subject matter, the defending lawyer may not suggest to the witness that the lawyer deem the question to be unclear. Lawyers may not object simply because they find a question to be vague, nor may they assume that the witness will not understand the question. There again, a reference to, I don't understand the question. If you understand it, you can go ahead and answer. I think that's the type of conduct he's, he's trying to get at there. He's also trying to address form objections that where the witnesses ask a question and the objections form vague. He's being, you're, he's criticizing the, the lawyers who are using the reference to form objections by giving some additional information about it as being vague. He's, he's suggesting that that's coaching witnesses. <clears throat> Judge Bennett cited with approval the Serrano case, 2012 Westlaw 28071, as well as the Hall case, 150 FRD. The parenthetical reference to one of those cases stated, if witness do not witnesses do not understand the question or need some language further some language further defining or some, some documents further explaining it, the witness can ask the opposing lawyer to clarify or to further explain the question. After all, the lawyer who asked the question is in a better position to explain the question than is the witness's lawyer. There again, these witnesses are in a strange process. They don't understand it. They don't understand that they can ask questions, that they can have questions repeated, that they can have questions rephrased, perhaps. They, but they need to be, frankly, coached in order to make those types of objections or make those types of statements, particularly if, if the judge is going to say that counsel can't do that. So. Quite often, you're making an objection in a deposition, not because you're trying to teach the witness to what the answer is, or not, although that it can happen, but you're also trying to phrase the questions in, in the response and your objection so that you're talking to the judge. You're letting the judge know what, what your, your, the opinion is and what, what the nature of the objection is. 
So those are things that are not approved by Judge Bennett. Judge Bennett also stated, it's improper for an attorney to interpret that the witness does not understand the question because the lawyer doesn't understand the question. I referred to that earlier. And I am re reminded of the uh, attorney, Brendan Sullivan. He was uh, in, in Washington, he was at some congressional hearing and he said, I think it was Oliver North hearings. And he said, Your Honor, he said, Senator, I'm sitting here, but I'm not a potted plant. And so that's one of the d distinctions you need to make as you sit there in depositions. Are you going to be a potted plant? Or are you going to make the objections to form and just say nothing more? Or are you going to try to facilitate the deposition somewhat? Judge Bennett says you can say form and that's it. Judge Bennett opined that when a lawyer tells the witness to answer, if you know, quote, it's not, it not so subtly suggests that the witness may not know the answer, inviting the witness to dodge or qualify an otherwise clear question. Now, I've always viewed the if you know question or objection as not so much an objection, but an assistance to the, the attorney. So you're not making an objection based on lack of proper and sufficient foundation, where the, the, the question assumes that the, lawyer, the witness knows something that they are, are not entitled to assume. That's a, that calls for a lack of proper and sufficient foundation objection. It's one of those objections that you're required to make if the question can be fixed at the time of the deposition. So form and foundation are, are the types of questions, that can, objections that relate to questions that can be fixed. I, I view the if you know question as merely trying to help out the, the plaintiff's lawyer or the defense lawyer who's asking the question where he didn't incorporate the term, do you know whether this is the case? Uh, and into his question, and, and he's asking a question that's otherwise objectionable by saying, if you know, all you're doing is saying, making it clear that the witness is not in, involved in speculation. When discussing the appropriate sanction for counsel's deposition conduct, Judge Bennett said, I would be well within my discretion to impose substantial monetary sanctions on counsel, but I'm less interested in negatively affecting counsel's pocketbook than I am positively affecting counsel's obstructive deposition practices. I'm also interested in deterring others who might be inclined to comport themselves similarly to counsel. So what did he do? What was, what was the sanction imposed? Judge Bennett required counsel to write and produce a training video in which counsel or another partner in counsel's firm appears and explains the holding and rationale of the opinion and provide specific steps lawyers must take to comply with its rationale in future depositions in federal and state courts. The video must specifically address the impropriety of the unspecified form of objections when it is coaching and excessive interruptions. So he was asking this Jones Day lawyer from Chicago to basically do a video that in, in, indicts themselves in terms of what they did and, and suggest how it should be fixed. And then the court would review it and let them know if it was okay. Well, as you might expect, the Jones Day lawyers appealed this matter to the Eighth Circuit and it was reversed and dismissed. Uh, the court said, first of all, one of the reasons why the judge, the, the, the duty to do the videotape deposition or the videotape uh, uh, training video was because it was a sui sponte objection. The judge made it on his own. The other party didn't make the objection. They must have been fine with it because they didn't make an objection at all. Even though they lost in the case, it wasn't part of any appeal to the Eighth Circuit. The other thing is that the timing that the court focused on the timing, this was a sui sponte objection made after the evidence was over, after the verdict was in, and then he decided he was going to sanction the plaintiff's counsel. <coughs> I would be remiss if I didn't cite the last part of Judge Bennett's opinion where he noted, despite counsel's deposition conduct, I was greatly impressed by counsel's performance at trial. Unlike litigators, there's that word again, counsel was extremely well prepared and had a clearly mastered and had clearly mastered the facts of the case and did a great job of incorporating electronic evidence into counsel's direct and cross-examination. Those are aspects of counsel's noteworthy trial skills, expertise and preparation are laudable but they do not expose counsel's pretrial conduct. Well, I'm glad this is what he, what he feels about the lawyer that won. What would he have done about the lawyer had the lawyer lost, is uh, what I say. What if the lawyer had been a litigator instead of a trial lawyer? It's, um, 
you know, the, the uh, sanction was thrown out by the Eighth Circuit. So that means the rest of the opinion that I was referring to earlier is no more than dicta. Uh, we, we don't have a, a citation that we can uh, live with in terms of Judge Bennett's uh, opinion of the, the testimony and the deposition misconduct. All right, let's move on. You may have seen this before, you may not have seen it before, but we're into the statutes that may be able to help you. Sometimes you run into a judge who is great on statutes and he's willing to say, you know, as long as there's a statute, I will enforce the statute. You cannot, but when it comes to common law, sometimes judges are either cold feet or they are unwilling to put common law on the same plane as statutes. This is just so you know, if you've got one of those cases where the judge needs to be informed about the common law and, and the fact that it's incorporated into the statute, this is the statute to cite. So much of the common law of England, as is applicable and not inconsistent with the various aspects of Nebraska law, is adopted and declared to be the law within the state of Nebraska. So that's a great thing to know if you've got a judge where you've got a, you're relying on common law and he somehow treats the common laws differently or a judge ordered law differently than uh, statutes, shown the statute about common law applicability because it should have the same force and effect of, of statutes. All right. Don't forget your old friend, contract interpretation. What am I referring to? I don't remember when it was, but it's sometime within the last 18 years, I brought the statute to you and said, I don't understand it. It's on the books, it's chapter 25, but you tell me if you understand it. And here it is. It's one of those statutes that I don't know that anybody can figure out exactly what it means or what it says. When the terms of an agreement have been intended in a different sense by the parties to it, that sense is to prevail against either party in which he had reason to suppose the other understood it. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. I would, say, I would say this, if you think you can find a way to make this work for your case, and <laughs> go ahead and cite it, because it has been cited in the court before. On the other hand, if, if somebody else cites it, I tell them, you can argue that you don't know what it means and you don't understand it. So it's just one of those questions. Uh, but it, it's in chapter 25, it's still there. It has not been written out of the books yet. So it's something to keep you aware of. Um, Nebraska Ethics <laughs> Advisory Opinion for Lawyers 2303. This was from last year, and it deals with referral fees and splitting commissions. Question presented, is it proper for a lawyer to refer a client to a licensed insurance agent and receive a split commission or referral fee from the agent or insurance company for the referral? And this is apparently an issue when it comes to estate planning cases and estate planning clients. It's not, nothing you're gonna run into, or I think that the, the opinion applies to if we're talking about criminal law, but if we're, if we're talking about estate planning, then this, this would apply. The answer is no, a lawyer's interest in selling life insurance or the financial products and the client's interest in receiving independent professional legal counsel free of compromise or differing interests. The words differing interests mean a conflict. And that's evident in the next paragraph, given the generic request and limited facts presented here, the conflict is not waivable. The facts are, are uh, uh, I'm not gonna go into the facts in a, in a whole, whole lot here, but basically New York Life Insurance Company wanted to create an alliance or a partnership with certain estate planning lawyers to get more work. And it would have resulted in the estate planning lawyers getting more uh, fee as a result of this referral. The opinion says, the issue is whether the referral fees pose a significant risk that the client's representation will be materially limited by the lawyer's personal interest in terms of the money that's being paid to the lawyer as a fee. And the court said we can't determine, or the uh, committee said we can't determine that that would not be the case. He said many state ethics committees have found the referral fee to create a significant risk to the client's representation under Rule 1.7 and that no amount of disclosure or explanation can overcome a lawyer's financial interest in directing a client to a specific service provider under Rule 1.8. So the, the committee realized that this was a problem. Uh, some, some other jurisdictions treat it uh, as, depending on the facts of the case, uh, allowing the, uh, the transaction, uh, the referral fee, if there's informed consent after full disclosure. But what is informed consent is how much you need, you need to tell your client about this before you do it. 
how do you make full disclosure? Those are kind of subjective and open-ended uh, questions. The Nebraska Advisory Committee found that, the, that receiving a fee for the referral and eventual sale of annuities Here we go. There we go. The Nebraska Advisory Committee has found that receiving a fee for the referral and eventual sale of annuities, life insurance, or similar financial products will create a conflict with the, with the client that cannot be reasonably waived when the lawyer's law firm services to the client are even tangentially related to estate planning services. So there again, I think this is a case that rely, relies on estate planning services um, being provided by the attorney. Uh, and then in those situations, it is not allowed and it's not waivable. Okay. Advertising, we've got a sponsor this year. Um, we, we succumbed to the monetary benefits of advertising. It's a law firm or a paw firm, excuse me. How Wolf and Chase. Here's three. And <laughs> Did your human break a treat in half and try to pass it off as a whole treat? You may be entitled to compensation. This is Fido Bono Esquire, the law firm owner. He says, our attorneys have seven times the experience chasing down tenant treats owed. Pause today to schedule a consultation. How Wolf and Chase, attorney to the paw. My thanks to Bruce Rohde and Sandra Marr for passing that on to me. That was a uh, I ran short of doing again a lot of funny videos and amusing text uh, uh, messages because uh, they're just not as prevalent anymore as they used to be. So anytime uh, people send anything like that in to me, I take a look at it. Uh, public reprimands were, were discussed in the next case, which is the uh, Rodriguez case. Thomas Rodriguez was an attorney who refused to appear for parole revocation hearings and represent his clients in cases where he had been appointed by the Scott <clears throat> County District Court. This is in Davenport, Iowa. It's where I'm from. He did not appear for hearings. He did not return phone calls or emails from the parole officers. His clients stated that he has not contacted them at the jail while they awaited their hearings. The board confirmed that Rodriguez failed to appear for multiple hearings after be, being appointed. And Rodriguez's response was, he had other stuff to worry about besides the hearings. <laughs> really? I mean, talk about witness coaching. This guy needs some coaching in terms of how to deal with the committee, if that's the kind of excuse he's, he's offering. But in any, in any event, the, uh, the board found that Rodriguez's failure to appear for the February 3, 2022 hearing implicated these other rules of the Iowa Rules of Professional Conduct. And so, so he was subject to sanction. Typically, the board would privately admonish an attorney for an isolated instance of those rule violations. However, this conduct mirrored his conduct in board file 22-324 with the same rule violations occurring during the same time frame. So basically, there are two separate complaints involving two separate parties that were treated the same way with him ignoring these parole hearings. It was for probation hearings. It was the determination of the board that Rodriguez should be public, publicly reprimanded for the above ethical misconduct. So he, he was going to get a private reprimand when it, it became two complaints instead of one. The board determined that they needed to do, do a public reprimand. The difference is private reprimands are that. They are private. Public reprimands are recorded in the big books and are published to the, to the public. Private and public reprimands in Nebraska. In the preface to the rules of, di of discipline for attorneys in the state of Nebraska, the term private reprimand is defined as follows. A reprimand of a member by the committee on inquiry of the appropriate judicial district or the Dis disciplinary review board, which shall be in writing, signed by the chairperson and vice chairperson and directed <coughs> to the member by the United States certified mail, return receipt requested, but shall not be made public. That's a private reprimand. The test pursuant to Nebraska Supreme Court Rule 3-309 H3, if it's determined that there are reasonable grounds for discipline of the responding attorney, but no public interest would be served by the institution of a formal charge, the inquiry panel shall prepare an issue to the respondent 
a private reprimand, which shall be made in a permanent, made a permanent part of the file in the office of the counsel for discipline. So basically, if it doesn't involve a client, if it, the client is being is not being hurt, but there's some other rule violation, it's subject to a pri private reprimand. This reprimand shall be received as evidence in, in, in any subsequent disciplinary proceeding against the respondent only after a finding of misconduct in the subsequent disciplinary proceeding. So you're only going to run into a problem with a private reprimand if there is a subsequent issue that puts you before the Committee on Inquiry or the Disciplinary Review Board. And if so, the private reprimand you had in the past will count against you. It's kind of like they can't use it for, for liability, but they can use it for damages. Nebraska Supreme Court Rule 3-313 deals with conditional admissions of agreements in the, in the complaint. These are typically used in pub public reprimands. So the lawyer may file with the clerk a conditional admission of a complaint in exchange for a stated form of consent judgment of discipline as to all or part of the grievance or complaint pending against him or her as determined to be appropriate by the Council of Discipline and the appropriate committee on inquiry. Basically, this is a conditional admission. It's like an offer of proof or an offer to confess judgment with an offer to confess judgment. If it's accepted by the court and by the Council for Discipline, then it will be written up and you will be subject to a public reprimand. That goes in the big books. Uh, the difference between a public reprimand and a private reprimand is just that. Public reprimand, everyone can see it. It's published. Private reprimand goes into the, your file, but no one else can see it. Another public reprimand case was the Leahy case from earlier this year in, in, uh, in Iowa. Didn't help Peter John Leahy any that he referred to the law firm as Biker Lawyers PC. Uh, the, the complaint MC, the initials were used for the complaining parties here and for the, the female, alleged that Leahy represented his wife TC in a child custody matter. Thereafter, Leahy represented his son, Cameron, in a different child custody dispute against TC. That's true. That's exactly what happened in this case. The court, the, uh, the Committee on Review and the court both indicated that Leahy's relationship with TC, the, the female, was complicated, but they didn't go into any further detail as to what the complications were. Cameron's relationship with TC ended soon after the child was born, and thereafter, TC informed Cameron there was a significant likelihood that the child was not his. Cameron refused to believe the child was not his, and they went to testing. After participating in gene genetic, genetic testing, it was determined that Cameron was not the father of the child. So you would think that would be over, that would be the end of the case. But Cameron didn't, didn't want to let go and didn't believe the testing. So after the results of the genetic testing, Leahy filed an appearance on behalf of his son, Cameron, and continued on in the, in the paternity case. Lee filed an affidavit. Lee filed an affidavit from a law clerk at the law firm while TC was employed there, in which the clerk discussed TC's alleged excessive drinking and also asserted that she had a long history of gaslighting individuals, specifically that she may be lying about events that have transpired. This was his attempt to throw her under the bus, and it didn't work. But he was trying to impact or affect her veracity and, and get the court to, to think that she was uh, not to be believed, particularly on whose child this was, even after there had been one genetic test that said that his son had not been the father. So a second paternity test was later confirmed, and that, that Cameron was not the father of TC's second child. At that point, the Supreme Court considered three factors when determining whether the matters are substantially related for purposes of Rule 32, Rule 1.9, basically. The nature and scope of prior representation, the nature of the, prior, the, nature of the present lawsuit, and three, whether the, cli the client, three, whether the client might have, might have disclosed the confidence to his or her attorney in the prior representation, which could be relevant in the present action. Well, the first situation, the first criteria is, is met, the second criteria is met. The third criteria is kind of interesting because it, it, it says whether the client might have disclosed the confidence. It, and one of the things we realized when we read this opinion was that there was no evidence, or no proof whatsoever that there was any confidential information actually exchanged between um, 
TC and and Blehy in the first uh, paternity case. But the uh, the opinion of the court was, moreover, given the identical nature of the two matters, which is true we're giving the first two, you would have certainly learned confidential information during your representation of TC. But they don't say what it was. They don't say it's under seal. They don't say anything other than you must have certainly learned about this information. So it really, to me, it reads out the, the third requirement because it's so easy to comply with once you have complied with the first two requirements. All right, the board noted you have previously been admonished by the board for a conflict of interest. So he, there is a prior reprimand somewhere in Leahy's past. It was therefore a determination of the board that you shall be publicly reprimanded. So again, they used the private reprimand for the basis to complain about, um, for the basis to adjudicate uh, TC or Leahy's, opinion, Leahy's status in the case. It was because he had the private reprimand that it then was shifted to a public reprimand in this case. All right, we're now to the fastest five minutes in ethics. We're all, almost to the end here. I wanted to bring to your attention Nebraska Ethics Advisory Opinion for Lawyers 24-02. It deals with an offer to con confess judgment. It's very procedurally complex. I would have put you all to sleep had I gone into that and tried to explain that. So um, I just, if you've got a case involving a, a situation where there is a offer to confess judgment and who it's on, on behalf of, this is the case to look at from an ethics perspective, but I'm not going to get into it other than that. And the metadata in the fastest five minutes of ethics deals with there we go. The Supreme Court inadvertently revealing a late change in the Trump Colorado ballot ruling. You may or may, you may, or may not have heard about this. But the Supreme Court's decision, decision to keep Donald Trump on Colorado's ballot was styled as being unanimous, albeit with concurrences and without any dissent. But the metadata in this case told a different story. In the metadata of the link to the opinion posted by the court, the opinion is styled as, a, as an opinion concurring in part and dissenting in part, with Justice Sotomayor alone dissenting. Presumably, the Supreme Court staff forgot to check the meta metadata before it went online. The court had scheduled the opinion's release, evidently, to hand it down before the Colorado primary. And I'm not trying to be political at all on this, it is what it is, but the way that the court handled the metadata was the focus of this, this article, and I thought it was interesting, so I would, thought I would bring it to your attention. The Supreme Court ruled that an individual state may not disqualify a presidential candidate from the ballot under Section 3 of of the 14th Amendment, which bars insurrectionists from regaining public <coughs> office. All nine justices agreed with this bottom line. Five justices, justices went further, however, declaring that only Congress may enforce Section 3 against federal candidates. In a brief opinion, Justice Barrett said the, the court should not have reached this broader question about con congressional authority. Justice Sotomayor made the same point in a longer opinion joined by Justice Kagan and Justice Brown Jackson. Her opinion is styled as a concurrence, but we now know that probably until late in the drafting process, it was actually labeled a dissent. We also know that the dissenting opinion was originally ascribed only to Judge Sotomayor. So this points out the importance of unanimity in political cases such as this when they're before the court. If they can all have a, a unanimous opinion, they would much rather do that than have any dissents because they want to have a united front as it relates to uh, any of these types of political questions that are currently before the court or look to be going before the court in the future. All right, so what have we learned? Coaching a witness is permitted, but it has its ethical limits. You should seriously consider accepting a private reprimand if it's offered, and if you do, stay out of ethical trouble after that and learn that. And next time, think twice before you let your dog see you break a treat in half. <laughs> so, our break time, thanks for your attention. Can you all hear me? Is this working all right? I, I didn't want to do the lapel mic. So, thumbs up? All right. So, since I don't have a PowerPoint, I know a good teacher would have a PowerPoint and it would be simple and elegant and you'd be able to follow along, but 
I'm just going to talk. We're just going to visit. Um, but remember, you get credit minute for minute, so it can't be all that bad. Uh, this seminar is focused on ethics and professionalism, so I'm going to start my remarks at the very beginning with the preamble to the rules of professional conduct. The preamble tells us that the lawyers have three distinct roles. The first role of a lawyer is as a representative of the client, right? That's the one that requires you to be a zealous but fair advocate. That's the role with which most of us are the most familiar. That's the reason most of us went to law school, right? That was the one that tripped our trigger. A second role of a lawyer is as an officer of the court. That role requires us to follow the law, to follow the rules of professional conduct, to be candid with the court, to be courteous to others in all of our professional interactions. We're pretty familiar with that one too. The lawyer's third role is one we don't talk about quite as much. It's our role as a public citizen having a special responsibility for the quality of the law. And it's this role that I plan to focus my remarks on today. Because of all the roles that lawyers play, I'm convinced that the role of public citizen is the one that holds the most promise uh, for improving our system of justice here in Nebraska. So what exactly does it mean to be a public citizen with a special responsibility for the law? As lawyers, we like nice, uh, tidy definitions. We like uh, a principle of law that can be repeated uh, in a syllabus point or in a Westlaw keynote. Uh, we like it to be supported by some precedent, but you're not likely to find that kind of clarity if you research the lawyer's role as a public citizen. In fact, you won't find a single published opinion, at least not a single published appellate opinion in Nebraska, telling you how to satisfy your role as an officer of the court. And you will find surprisingly little guidance in the literature talking about how to fulfill this role. So even though there's no um, generally accepted definition of a public citizen, the rules of professional conduct give us a description of what we should be aspiring to in paragraph six. I'm gonna read you the entire paragraph. See, I should have had a PowerPoint, but I'm gonna read you this paragraph and I'm gonna say ahead of time uh, a little disclosure. How many of you have read those opinions from the Supreme Court in the 20s and 30s before the paragraph was invented, right? <laughs> you start reading them and they just go on and on and on without a break. And then you turn the page and they go on and on. So this is not that bad. It's a, it's a long paragraph, but it's not like those opinions from the 20s and 30s. So here's, here's what we're supposed to aspire to as public citizens. Can y'all still hear me? Oh, that's better. Okay. As a public citizen, a lawyer should seek improvement of the law, access to the legal system, the administration of justice, and the quality of service rendered by the legal profession. As a member of a learned profession, a lawyer should cultivate knowledge of the law beyond its use for clients, should employ that knowledge in reform of the law, and should work to strengthen legal education. In addition, a lawyer should further the public's understanding of and confidence in the rule of law and the justice system because legal institutions in a constitutional democracy depend on popular participation and support to maintain their authority. But wait, there's more. A lawyer should be mindful of the deficiencies in the administration of justice and of the fact that the poor and sometimes persons who are not poor cannot afford adequate legal assistance. Therefore, all lawyers should devote professional time and resources and use civic influence to ensure equal access to our system of justice for all those who, because of economic or social barriers, cannot afford or secure adequate legal counsel. One more sentence. You've got one more rule. A lawyer should aid the legal profession in pursuing these objectives and should help the bar regulate itself in the public interest. There's a lot there to unpack, right? Um, but I read this paragraph to suggest that as a public citizen, there are four overarching principles. First, the lawyers should be working to improve equal access to the legal system. Second, 
lawyers should work to improve deficiencies in the administration of justice. Third, lawyers should work to improve the law itself, the body of law. And fourth, lawyers should work to elevate the quality and the competency of all of us, of all lawyers, the profession generally. So uh, I'm not going to keep you here all day talking about all of that, but I'm going to explore in the 30 minutes that I have um, some ways that I see Nebraska lawyers meeting these, satisfying these four overarching principles of being a good public citizen. Um, I hope through this discussion to sort of convince you, persuade you that this is attainable, that it's happening around us all the time already, that you can achieve it yourself, and hopefully you see yourself in some of the examples that I share. Can you still hear me all right? Okay. Because I'm going to say the podium is kind of down here, and my notes and my readers are up here, and it's not as easy as I thought it might be. So I'm going to start with lawyers who are working to improve access to the courts. Nebraska trial courts, like courts everywhere, have a staggering number of people attempting to navigate the court system without the benefit of a lawyer. The rise in the number of self-represented litigants isn't a new phenomenon in Nebraska. It's been accelerating for several decades. Um, when current Omaha Bar Association President Andy Wilson and I graduated from law school in 1991, it was pretty uncommon to see a self-represented litigant in the courtroom. Now it's commonplace. Let me share a few statistics with you. In fiscal year 2023, there were more than 281, 625 new cases filed in Nebraska's trial courts in our county, district, and separate juvenile courts. There were approximately 1,000 appeals docketed from those cases in our appellate courts. And I can't tell you exactly how many of those cases had a self-represented litigant, but I can tell you that Nebraska's data generally tracks with the statistics nationally. And nationally, somewhere between 50 to 75% of all civil cases and domestic relations cases have at least one party who is representing themselves. So in other words, in 2024, the civil cases in Nebraska with lawyers on both sides of the dispute are the exception and not the norm. We can debate the reasons for that, um, but we can't deny what's the new normal. A significant percentage of litigants are navigating the court system without an attorney, and this has a profound impact on the quality of justice. This new normal has required some pretty significant operational changes to the court system, and it makes the lawyer's role as a public citizen even more critical to the orderly administration of justice. No speech would be good without a quote of Roscoe Pound, so here it is. I'm tucking it in here. Uh, more than 70 years ago, Roscoe Pound noted, and I quote, when every man is his own lawyer, the work that ought to have been in the hands of trained, responsible members of the profession falls necessarily into the hands of the court. He was right. <laughs> there is an increased understanding today that courts can't administer justice fairly or efficiently unless self-represented litigants are provided with basic legal resources, instructions on how to prepare their case, forms, those sorts of things. So almost 20 years ago, the Nebraska Supreme Court created the Self-Represented Litigant Committee, and it tasked that committee of lawyers and judges to study the growing number of self-represented litigants and to develop specific recommendations to adapt the court system to manage efficiently those cases and to ensure that everyone had equal access to the courts without compromising the independence of the court and the fairness of the court. That's a heavy lift. All of the judges and lawyers who have served on that self-represented litigant committee for the past 20 years have been acting as public citizens. Some of their early efforts were focused on developing standardized forms. Um, Lawyers are not always big fans of those forms, and I get it. I wasn't a big fan of them when I was a lawyer. I became a fan of them when I was a district court judge, and here's why. 
If you wonder what kind of an impact standard forms can have, I'm going to share some more statistics with you. And these are a couple of years old still. Um, 2022 was the last time we tracked this. But the divorce forms on the Nebraska Supreme Court website had more than 40,000 views. Those are people who were going to the internet to get the forms instead of talking to all of you. Protection order forms had more than 28,000 views. Guardianship and conservatorship forms had almost 25,000 views. Name change forms had about 20,000. You get the idea, right? These forms are, there's a voracious appetite for these forms among the court users who are trying to navigate the system by themselves. But we all know, all of us in this room know, that providing meaningful access to the courts requires uh, more than just a robust forms directory. There is no doubt that just a few minutes with a licensed lawyer would give these litigants a lot more benefit than they get from talking to court staff about the procedure to follow. So here's some good news. Each year, the Nebraska Supreme Court's Access to Justice Commission recognizes the lawyers and the law students in our state who have provided uh, significant pro bono work over the prior year. And I'm pleased to report that every year for the past several years, that number who are being recognized, the number of lawyers and law students just keeps ticking up, just keeps going up. More and more of you are volunteering uh, to offer pro bono legal services through a variety of um, means things like the NSBA's Volunteer Lawyers Project, serving at self-help desks or pop-up legal clinics, participating in Nebraska Free Legal Answers, providing pro bono representation as part of the Tenant Assistance Project, volunteering their legal services through any number of other legal clinics and programs. If you are one of the people in the past year who has done that, I want you to stand and be recognized because it's important work and I want, to be, I want us all to thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. I, I was a tiny bit worried it was going to be a bust, but I'm, thank you for that. Um, and I, and I want to mention one more thing. I said we've seen the number of volunteers, the number of lawyers offering pro bono services. We've seen that tick up. But here's something that I think is even more impressive. One of the things that scared me away from pro bono work when I was a practicing lawyer is that most of the need was in a practice area where I didn't have any expertise. I, I leaned heavy on that excuse. Um, and what I'm seeing now are lawyers with the courage to say, I see the problem, I know I'm needed, and I will learn a new area of the law. The number of lawyers who have stepped up and learned new areas of the law is increasing every year, and I think that's reason to be very encouraged. Um, I know I speak on behalf, I, there's some judges in the room, I know I speak on behalf of all of them when I say thank you to the lawyers who are offering pro bono services. What you do makes a difference to the clients you are serving, and it makes a difference to the system as a whole. It also makes a difference to all of your colleagues because it demonstrates to those people the importance of a lawyer, the benefit that a lawyer can bring, and it makes it a little less likely that the next time they have a legal question, they'll turn to the internet instead of a lawyer. So thank you for what you do. Um, I'm, the realization that lawyers can have a powerful impact on a case prompted the Nebraska Supreme Court to change the rules of professional conduct in 2008 to expressly allow limited scope representation as an alternative to full representation. And in 2019, the Self-Represented Litigant Committee put together a toolkit that makes it almost mindlessly easy to offer this sort of option to your clients. Um, it includes a toolkit, uh, the checklists, the forms, um, engagement letters, sample fee agreements, all those things. Take a look at it. It's on the Supreme Court website. It is a toolkit that's designed to make it easy for practicing lawyers to accommodate, to sort of incorporate low bono work into their ordinary uh, business practice. And it's one way that anybody can act as a public citizen and improve access to the courts. Uh, even though we tend to focus on civil legal needs when we're talking about pro bono work, 
Uh, I want to expressly recognize the lawyers in Nebraska who take criminal and juvenile appointments and who serve as guardians ad litem because they are also acting as public citizens and improving access to justice. One of the challenges that's currently facing our courts, particularly in our more rural communities, is the reality that there aren't enough lawyers who are willing to accept court appointments. We've got right now, hovering between 14 and 15 counties in our 93 counties where there's not a single lawyer, not a single one. And about a third of our 93 counties have three or fewer lawyers. So there are judges out there who are struggling to find people, lawyers, competent lawyers who will accept public appointments, uh, court appointments, and this type of legal representation is critically important to our system of justice. Uh, so lawyers who accept those appointments are most certainly acting as public citizens. It's another example. We have in Nebraska right now about 5,700 active lawyers who are living in Nebraska. And we've got several thousand more who are licensed in Nebraska but living outside Nebraska. If each of those Nebraska lawyers would follow the example of the lawyers I've just mentioned, we would not just narrow the justice gap and improve access to the courts, we would transform the way Nebraska administers justice for every court user. <laughs> I want to talk to you next about lawyers who are working to improve deficiencies in the administration of justice. This is pretty obvious, right? I mean, every single one of us every day encounters something about the law that's just not working as well as it could. Um, we have a lot of pinch points in a great big system. Uh, and as busy legal professionals, it's sometimes tempting to just navigate around those problems. But the lawyer's role as a public citizen calls on each of us to be mindful of the deficiencies in the administration of justice and to assume a responsibility for making it better. In other words, as a public citizen, lawyers should view deficiencies in the justice system as their responsibility. Many of you do that. Uh, they shouldn't merely curse the status quo and move on. They shouldn't fight to preserve the status quo if there are reforms that can be made to improve the system. So one way many Nebraska lawyers improve the administration of justice is by becoming active in their state and, uh, and local bar associations. Being active in the bar doesn't just provide you with opportunities to network and expand your practice. Uh, it also provides an effective form to identify the reforms that are needed in your community to devise workable solutions, right? Imagine the solutions, and then to work with the judiciary to implement those solutions. Uh, I, the chief, would be mad at me if I didn't also mention that the Nebraska Supreme Court is always looking for lawyers to serve on the many committees and commissions that we have that are focused specifically on improving the courts. Um, these include things like the Access to Justice Commission, all of its standing committees, um, we also make appointments to, to uh, a lot of other committees and commissions, and it sometimes can be challenging to find lawyers who raise their hand. Um, it's important work, and it is the work of a public citizen. When I started out as a new lawyer, I had no idea. I simply had no idea that there were hundreds of lawyers and judges who, in addition to their regular duties, set aside time to work on advisory committees and commissions to improve the administration of justice. These committees cover every court level, every practice area, and although most of the work happens quietly uh, with very little fanfare, these committees have a profound impact on improving the administration of justice in Nebraska. Most of the court's most transformative projects started with a single lawyer or a single judge who saw a problem didn't shuffle past it, offered to work alongside others to recommend a solution that was eventually adopted by the court and ended up transforming the justice system. It starts with just one of us. There's plenty of that sort of collaboration happening now, and each new project, I think, holds the, the possibility of removing more barriers and realizing, helping the judicial branch to realize the promise of equal justice for everyone. Volunteering to serve on these committees is a good way to get to know your judges, a good way to get to know your colleagues, and a good way 
to improve the administration of justice in your community. Another way to do it, another way to improve the uh, deficiencies in the administration of justice is just by practicing civility. The good news is that here in Nebraska, we don't seem to be having the crisis of civility that they're having in some states. Most Nebraska lawyers are just, I guess what I would call gold standard examples of professional civility. They are courteous and respectful to litigants, lawyers, judges, and court staff. They obey progression orders when a judge enters one and they agree to extensions when it won't prejudice the rights of their client. They stipulate to the receipt of evidence that they know is admissible under the rules. They take reasonable positions on discovery. You heard Mr. Paul say that judges don't like discovery disputes. And honestly, as a practicing lawyer, I didn't understand why. They were so interesting to me, right? I'd spent a lot of time answering those responses to requests for production in a precise way, and I was gonna defend it until the death. Um, once I took the bench, I realized why the judges don't like discovery disputes. Y'all can solve them on your own, right? You don't need the judge to do that, and you know it. You know it. <laughs> That's why judges don't like them. Um, they especially don't like those motions in limine that are really three pages of saying, judge, apply the rules of evidence. They don't like those either. So don't take those to the judges. Um, but most lawyers, in Nebraska are on time, they're well prepared, they're reasonable and flexible in their scheduling, they keep their demeanor calm, they keep the dramatic rhetoric down, and they don't villainize their opponents. They keep their promises to the court and to opposing counsel, and when they can't keep a promise, they tell them why. They work hard to provide the judges with the kind of evidence and legal precedent that the judge needs to make the right decision. This kind of civility in the practice strengthens the quality of the judicial decision making in Nebraska, and it allows the justice system to function more efficiently so that our courts can deliver faster, fairer justice to everybody. And although this next observation is completely anecdotal, uh, from where I sit, it looks to me like the courteous lawyers, the lawyers who practice civility, just get better results. I assume that's because they build better relationships with their clients and with their adversaries. They get better information from the witnesses and they're ultimately viewed as more persuasive by the juries and the judges. So I'm gonna talk now about the third principle um, and tell you a little bit about some lawyers who I see working to improve the quality of the law, the law itself. The preamble calls on every lawyer to be mindful of the impact their actions have on the quality of the law and to make decisions that improve the law. So when we are acting as public citizens, lawyers are called upon to consider more than the success of, um, of their advocacy they are called upon to consider the larger footprint that their advocacy leaves on the body of law. As a lawyer, the issues that you raise and the arguments you make and the positions for which you advocate will do more than just impact the clients you represent. They shape the body of the law. Sometimes they do that for the better and sometimes not. I've seen lawyers advocate for positions that have clarified the law and have made that law easier to apply and understand in the next case. I've also seen lawyers advocate for positions that may benefit their client in that moment, but could have a disastrous effect on the quality of our jurisprudence generally. Anytime a lawyer resists the temptation to practice law in a way that creates a short-term advantage for their client at the expense of sound workable precedent for the rest of us, they're acting as a public citizen. Improving the quality of the law also requires lawyers to be candid with the court. Um, it's an act of civility, I would suggest, to concede a point when the law doesn't support your position. It shows you are a lawyer who knows the law and follows the law, and it shows concern. It shows your concern for the efficiency of the judicial process. It also demonstrates uh, respect 
for the judicial decision maker's time. Uh, judges remember lawyers who wasted their time. Don't be one of those lawyers. Judges also remember the lawyers who helped them avoid making a mistake by correcting something that was misstated in a brief or misstated in testimony. Judges need to be able to rely on what you say. So if you become aware of a misstatement, don't just stuff it down. Um, or if you become aware of an oversight in a pleading or, or uh, some, a brief that you submit to the court, let the judge know about it. When you correct mistakes, you get a reputation for honesty and you're viewed as a lawyer who wants to get it right and who wants to help the court get it right. It's also an act of civility to disclose legal authority that the court needs to avoid an erroneous decision. We all know this, we all learned this in law school, but the rules of professional conduct actually require lawyers to let the court know of legal authority that's directly adverse to their position if their opponent doesn't point it out. Um, I have been the beneficiary of that kind of civility several times. And it not only helped me make the decision that the law required, it had a ripple effect on that lawyer's reputation because judges talk. And we know the lawyers who have earned a reputation for being candid and those who haven't. So improving the quality of the law also involves helping the public understand the law. The preamble reminds us that a lawyer should further the public's understanding of and confidence in the rule of law and the justice system because legal institutions in a constitutional democracy depend on popular participation and support to maintain their authority. Many Nebraska lawyers improve the public understanding of the courts just by engaging in public life in their community and showing others how the skill and advice of a lawyer can help manage risk and can improve outcomes. These lawyers serve on boards. They serve on charitable organizations. They speak to students about civics on law day and on any other day, on career day. They teach students about the proper role of the courts in our constitutional democracy, and they educate community leaders and legislators about the proper role of the courts. They also defend the independence and the uh, the independence of the judiciary if it is under attack. This sort of community engagement, and, and I, by that I mean engagement sort of beyond your client base, not only improves the public's general understanding of the law, it also helps ordinary citizens see that they too have a critical role to play in the proper administration of justice through things like jury service, through things like judicial selection and retention elections, so talk about the citizen's role in our justice system when you have the opportunity. And finally, see, we're almost to the end. How much time, how are we doing on time? You're good. I'm good. <laughs> Last thing I'm gonna do is tell you how much time you got. You got all the time. <laughs> No, that's what I'm talking about. You improve the administration of justice when you tell me how much time I have. You gotta be candid with me. Okay, you're done then. <laughs> well, I got, I've got just a smidge more. Okay, so this is, the last, this is the last of those four overarching principles. And this is um, lawyers working to improve the quality of legal services that we all provide, right? This is lifting the rest of us up by, up, up by our bootstraps. The preamble reminds us that as a member of a learned profession, lawyers should cultivate knowledge of the law beyond its use for clients and employ that knowledge to reform the law and to strengthen legal education, right? So this calls upon each of us to do what we can to improve everybody's lawyering, not just our own lawyering. Um, so here's how I see it, it play out over and over and over. A lawyer, as they progress in their career and they develop expertise in an area, they act as a public citizen if they look for ways to share that expertise with other lawyers so the whole profession is elevated. A lot of lawyers do that through things like scholarly contributions, through articles in the bar magazine, through seminar presentations like the ones you heard before mine, um, through regular mentoring of other lawyers, 
uh, by serving as adjunct faculty for the clinic programs uh, at the various law schools and by taking on important leadership roles in their local bars, in their state bars, uh, and in national organizations focused on specific practice areas. I'm going to share one real life example. Um, you all know my colleague, Bill Castle. Uh, in the early 1990s, when Justice Castle was a practicing attorney in what was then the 15th Judicial District and is now the 8th Judicial District, he developed a template spreadsheet um, program that let him do child support calculations faster and more accurately. After he went on the district court bench in 1992, he used that template himself and then he shared it with other lawyers. Uh, at the time, the only way to share it was on a floppy disk, so that's what he did. Just printed them out on floppy disks and handed them out like candy. So they could do the calculations more easily too. Eventually, Judge Castle created a website for the district court so that lawyers and litigants could access the child support calculator that way rather than having to come in and ask for it and get the floppy disk. Eventually, um, he, he, well, he had to keep updating the, the spreadsheets each time the tables changed, uh, each time the poverty threshold changed, and he personally updated those because he wanted everybody who had come to rely on them to be getting it right. He tells me that the formula at one point got so complicated, you know, for several families, several kids, um, that the spreadsheet had six levels of logic and it took up six feet of, remember that serrated folded computer paper from the olden days? Six feet is how long it took for that child support worksheet to print. And the good news is that these days we've got uh, very efficient child support calculators available online for lawyers to use. And Judge Castle's prototype template from the 1990s is is just a page in the history books, but his idea to develop a child support template and his willingness to share that template with other judges and other lawyers with the entire practicing bar, that's a perfect example of being a public citizen. And we all know lawyers like this, lawyers who figured out a way to do some legal task better or faster or smarter, and rather than keep that advantage for themselves and monetize it, they freely shared it with other lawyers so that everyone could serve their clients better. That's being a good public citizen. Another way to improve everyone's lawyering is to do your part to help regulate the practice of the law. If you become aware that a colleague is struggling with mental health or substance use issues, don't ignore it. Lawyers, judges, and law students report substance use and mental health challenges at a rate higher than most other professions. And the bar provides confidential help to everyone if they need it. The Nebraska Lawyers Assistance Project, it's also NLAP, is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to offer completely confidential peer support, intervention, treatment referrals for Nebraska lawyers, judges, and law students who are affected by substance use disorders, by mental health issues, by depression, or anything else that might impair their ability to practice law. If you don't know somebody in the legal community who has been affected by those issues already, you will. And more than half of NLAP's calls come from people who are concerned about a colleague or a family member, and they get them help before a disciplinary issue arises. So I just want to remind everybody that that is another way to be a public citizen. Finally, I want to give a shout out to all um, the Nebraska lawyers and judges who improve the quality of lawyering of all of us simply by their daily examples of civility and professionalism. They conduct themselves in a way that models respect and restraint and fairness they show us that zealous advocacy can coexist with honesty and integrity, and they inspire all of us to be the very best versions of ourselves in our own careers by showing us how we can disagree without being disagreeable, and by showing us how to maintain civility even when our opposing counsel is acting more like Saul Goodman than Atticus Finch. That was my only joke, and I thought it was gonna get a little bit better response. <laughs>
<laughs> I had to look up Saul Goodman to make sure I was getting it right. <laughs> Uh, we can all name the lawyers in our personal careers who have modeled that kind of civility and professionalism toward us even when we may not have deserved it. And I want to suggest that you find time to thank those lawyers while they're still around <laughs> and then commit to being that kind of example for the next generation of lawyers. I have some people who had a profound impact on my life and I didn't let them know in time and now I can't let them know. So don't make that same mistake. So I'm tying it up now. Um, at the beginning of these remarks, I told you that I thought that of all the roles a lawyer plays, the role as a public citizen holds out the most promise to change the system. And I think discussing the examples of that gives you an idea of why. Lawyers have the education, the expertise, and the platform to help move our system of justice a little bit closer to the constitutional ideal of equal justice for all. And even though the legal system will keep functioning, whether or not lawyers neglect their roles as public citizens, the system will not function as well if you neglect it. When a lawyer focuses exclusively on their role as a zealous advocate and neglects their role as a public citizen, the quality of the entire system suffers for it. So, as you leave the seminar today and head into your weekend, I'm, I'm going to ask that you take some time to reflect on your own responsibility for improving the quality of the law in Nebraska. Ask yourself, what are you doing to improve equal access? What deficiencies do you see? Which deficiencies did you see just this week and cursed? And what could you do to improve them? What are you doing to improve the clarity and the understandability of the law, and what can you do to elevate the quality and competency of all of us? I hope you found some inspiration from the lawyers who take time out of their professional lives to focus on improving the quality of justice in Nebraska, and I suggest that if we all commit to doing just a little bit more to fulfill our role as public citizens, the results would be transformational. Um, I want to thank you for your attention. I hope I got you a few extra minutes of CLE credit. Um, thank you for taking the time to come to seminars like this and for putting on seminars like this. They are important. Um, they're inspiring. Uh, and I'm, it's my honor to be here. Thank you very much.